Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for episode 21. Um, got a few topics to talk about today. It won't be too long and as I try to get these shows out now, I just want to give you a heads up. I am going to be doing some traveling over the next couple of weeks, so it may, may not see much for me in the next couple of weeks or so, but I will try to get something out when I'm back uh, within that time period. So first story I want to talk about today is an interesting one. I tweeted it a few days ago. It was an announcement by the province of British Columbia, a beautiful province here in Canada. By the way, if you haven't been there, please go check it out. Support British Columbia tourism. Awesome. I used to live there. It's a beautiful province. But they're, of course, very environmentally friendly and very forward thinking from an environment perspective here in Canada. Well, the government has come out with an announcement that they want to plan a phase out of non-electric car sales. So basically banning the sale of ICE cars uh, by the year 2040 and it's a pretty interesting move here in Canada it's the first announcement of its kind from a finality perspective actually get to 100% of zero emission cars only being sold in the province by a certain date which is 2040 now that includes uh, light duty cars and trucks so, so consumer vehicles of course and that's a big move because there's a lot of pickup trucks and SUVs in BC believe me and and rightly so now, the province uh, government wants to implement these requirements in stages. They want to start with a 10% um, met of their goal by the year 2025, which is only about six years away, folks. 30% by 2030, and of course, meeting the final 100% of that goal for the year 2040. Now, to help speed up this goal and to help process it, they're going to continue ex putting money into a fast charging infrastructure in British Columbia to support the adoption of EV, uh, EVs, and specifically battery electric vehicles zero emission uh, on and and uh, of course continue with their plug-in uh, incentives they they currently have an incentive which you can get five thousand uh, dollars back or off the price of a battery electric vehicle and a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle in the province of british columbia and if you purchase a fuel cell vehicle you can get six grand back but there's not many of those happening they want to put additional money into that fund to continue with the incentives uh Ontario Ford government, if you're listening, please take some notes. But anyway, that's another story. Now, countries that are banning the sale of ICE cars in some way as well include Israel, then Denmark, which are going to want to achieve those goals by 2030, Scotland by 2032, and then France, Spain, and the UK by the year 2040. Now, I'm not sure if that's all cars or just a portion of, of the sales being uh, banned for ICE cars or not, but at least there are targets, and it's good to see British Columbia stepping up. I hope the rest of Canada takes notice and follow suit. Well, I got to talk about Tesla on every show or almost every show, but not a whole lot to talk about because we all know things are, are flying off the shelves when it comes to the Model 3s. But Tesla did come out with an announcement this week that they want to double their supercharger network by the end of next year. And that's quite an achievement. I, I've talked about this before. And when Trevor and I were doing the Model 3 shows, we talked about the growth in the supercharging network and some of the numbers there in the past. But to uh, to double that now within the next year is a pretty aggressive mandate. Again, that's uh, Tesla's secret sauce as Elon took the attitude of uh, if I build it, they will come. And that's exactly what he did. And that's exactly what happened. Smart move of putting the infrastructure in to support the sale of battery cars. But now that battery electric vehicles are becoming more mainstream and lots of other networks and so forth are getting involved, uh, it's good to see that Tesla is not slowing down. They're going to maintain, if not really expand their supercharger network. So they want to double it by the end of next year, which will mean that about 95 to almost all owners that have a Tesla vehicle in the geographies that they sell it will be close enough to a supercharger to take advantage of it. And that's quite an achievement from that perspective from one manufacturer. Now, current generation of superchargers can pump out about 135 kilowatts um, to Tesla vehicles today, but most vehicles really can only get about 120, which we see from a top rate. So good on Tesla to continue their expansion as, of course, thousands and thousands and thousands more Model 3s hit the streets. And I know that that was a big concern by a lot of uh, prospective buyers and owners uh, would be the availability of superchargers once all those four or 500,000 Model 3s got out there eventually. Uh, so it's good to see Tesla keeping up with that. So I want to jump back quickly just to Hyundai. I talked about the Kona and the Kia Niro EV a lot now in the last few shows because I'm really, really pumped about those cars. I think they're they're a, a, a kind of a game changer in this battery electric vehicle marketplace. They're really going after a nice sweet spot from a price, performance, range, size, all that kind of stuff. Well, there's a good uh, report coming out about Hyundai. And, and as I mentioned in some of the other shows, that my concern was that they wouldn't be able to pump out enough of these things to really meet the demand because I think there's going to be 
a huge demand for these two vehicles. Well, from Hyundai's Kona's perspective, uh, on the EV side, they have announced that they have ramped up production. Uh, originally, they're only selling a couple of thousand or so, uh, you know, a thousand or so a month, uh, predominantly in the South Korean marketplace, but also about a thousand or so more throughout uh, Europe. Primarily, Norway got the bulk of those uh, initial Kona EV deliveries. However, they have achieved as of last month, the end of September, uh, sorry, end of October, a figure of just over 4,600 Kona EVs that were they, they were able to produce, with about half of them staying in Korea and the other half going to international markets, including Norway, some other European countries, the UK, and so forth. Um, now, like Tesla, as I just mentioned earlier, um, uh, Hyundai's taken that approach, like Tesla did with the Model 3, of building the long-range version first and coming out with that model. So they have two two range versions, around a 40 kilowatt hour and about a 60 kilowatt hour, or in this case, a 64 kilowatt hour version, which is their long range, and that's all they're producing right now is that long range version with a different trim levels, of course, for options. But the battery pack is that size, which is good for about 300 miles or EPA, roughly about that, maybe 290 or so. So decent miles at about a price of about $40,000 US, give or take, depending on where what options. Well, that's great. I really hope that Hyundai can keep up those production numbers of about 4,600 or so a month, because that would give them about 50,000 or so ish a year, yeah, hopefully a little bit more than that. And I'm sure that if uh, Hyundai could do that, Kia could do the same for the Nero EV. Uh, I believe they they um, share the same chassis. And if uh, Kia can do that, then you're looking at an excess of 100,000 uh, electric vehicles, battery electric vehicles, on top of the Ionics and and you know whatever else they, they plan to do. So that would be great to see those two companies do that. I, again, I think those those vehicles are, are hitting a great sweet spot from a price performance. Uh, usability perspective and affordability. So good on that. Um, if uh, I know I've talked to a couple of people already by email and stuff that are an anxiously awaiting their Kona deliveries or their, or their their Nero EV deliveries. And when you do get one, let me know what you think. Switching gears here to Honda. Now, Honda, we haven't ha I haven't had a lot to say about those. I think about a year or so ago, Trev and I quickly talked about the concept Honda that they were coming out with their Urban, and I'll get to that in a sec. Uh, now, of course, Honda did have a Fit EV, FIT, the Honda Fit model that had an electric vehicle version, EV version of it, but it was very limited, um, and it was primarily at the Japanese market, a very small scale, and they only sold about uh, 1,100 or so in select U.S. States, so just a few of the ZEV states, to my understanding. Well, Honda has announced that they're going to partner with a Chinese battery manufacturer, Contemporary Amperex Technology, or CATL, and they're going to partner to develop an affordable electric Honda Fit that goes the distance, according to this headline. Well, what does that mean? That means that the Honda Fit, or also known as the Jazz in some markets, is to be ready in the year 2020. So again, not that far away, a year and a half or so. It'll be the good thing about this announcement is that it's a global announcement. So this car will be available globally, not just in Japanese or select markets. Uh, and they want to do a volume of around up to about 100,000 a year, at least to get that thing going. They're going to keep a price point, uh, so, or what Honda states, of about 18,000 US or about 15.5 a euro. Uh, with a range of about 300 kilometers or 186 or so miles and uh, i'm not sure if that's epa or not so even even if the real world even if the epa is like 125 to 150 miles 200 to 240 kilometers and and you know at that price point you know of of 18,000 us add a few options crank it up to 21 or so um, and convert that to canadian you're in the 26 27 you know maybe 28k range well under 30. Uh, that's a pretty compelling vehicle to get out there and i i've always uh, thought to myself, and every time I see a Honda Fit riding around, they're great cars, and it's a great platform to put a more affordable battery electric vehicle into. I think it's it's outstanding if Honda can do that. And as I mentioned in the last show or couple of shows, it's all about affordability now to bring those economies of scales down, bring that pricing down as batteries, cell technology comes down and manufacturing costs and all that good stuff as everybody spins up. Get that affordability out there to more of the mass market. If you can get something down to the $20,000 range, goodness me, that's going to start flying off the shelves, especially with a, with an infrastructure in place. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to hear this from Honda because they've been real slow in kind of reacting to the electric vehicle marketplace. So it's good to see that they're playing catch up now, not just from a compliance perspective, but actually getting into it. And staying with Honda, they've come up with, a, uh, there's been some spy pictures that I'm putting up behind me, uh, of their urban EV, so that concept that I mentioned earlier that uh, that they announced, 
um it's you know retro kind of styling it was pretty cute kind of kind of one of these things you want to hug i guess um and right now there's some shots of the right hand drive so i guess this is in the uk marketplaces where the right hand drives are being tested uh that there there are some spy shots so that's good when you see concept vehicles actually out on the road in their camouflage paint schemes or or uh, sticker schemes or wrap schemes that's good news that means that stuff is happening within that manufacturer that means that deliveries of the cars aren't going to be too far away um, now there's not a lot of specs we have on this urban ev other than it's probably going to be around 150 or so miles 250 or so kilometers um, and we don't have any pricing but I, i'm guessing because it's a compact slash maybe even a subcompact size uh, certainly a uh, price uh, size range and feature range it should be into that 25,000 to 30,000 price range I mean Hondas aren't cheap but uh, they're priced fairly uh, well in the marketplace so uh, hopefully it'll come in at that price and uh, we'll have to see don't have any idea battery packs but I'm assuming for that kind of range of about 150 miles it'll be somewhere in the 40 kilowatt uh, hour range or so but we'll have to wait and see I also wanted to talk about, uh, I got an email and thank you to my uh, viewer that sent me an email regarding, and I am, I'm sorry I forget the gentleman's name, uh, about E.Go Mobile. It's a, a German a manufacturer of uh, electric vehicles and electric transportation, if I'm getting that correct. Um, in Germany and they have announced and come out with a, they've actually opened a pop-up store in Köln, uh, Germany, if I've got that correct. And they've um, uh, they have uh, come out with an uh, all-electric battery electric vehicle and some pictures coming up behind me here they call it the e.go life and they also have an e.go mover which is kind of like a small little mini bus type of environment all electric and they have a funky kind of go-kart thing called the e.go cart i'm not going to talk about the last two i want to focus a bit more on the e.go light life now that is a, a compact model design that ha comes in three battery pack size levels they call it the life 20 the life 40 and the life 60 and what that means is that they come with um so battery packs from roughly around those size ranges is a 14.9 kilowatt hour battery pack a 17.9 kilowatt hour battery pack and a just under 24 uh, kilowatt hour battery pack to give you different ranges uh, these are great uh, urban type cars as you can see from the photos behind me again what's this with this design i just want to come out and hug that thing <laughs> give it a big hug pretty cute looking car it looks really nice from a build quality perspective and again anything coming from germany they're usually pretty good uh, pretty good now these vehicles have an nedc ranges of anywhere from 120 to 180 kilometers 184 or so so actual you know anywhere from 100 to 150 kilometer range so you can convert that back to miles yourself but with shorter charging times in the five to nine hours depending on the battery pack right? these are four seater uh, automobiles great for urban commuting and the good thing about them is the price points they start at about 15 9 euros and go up to about 19 9 euros for the larger size model and i guess depending on what options are available uh, i believe they're taking orders or at least you can you can go into the pop-up store have a look touch feel sit in one don't think they're doing test drives yet but i'm not sure if anybody has gone to the store and gone into a test drive and talked to these guys and or if you've ordered one please let me know. I'd love to hear from you and see and understand what your thoughts are. Send me a video if you want and tell me all about your experience. And if you've got one in order, let me know what the, they're quoting for ETA times because I don't have any times here that were uh, given to me in this website in the article that I'm referencing. But again, it's just great to see these pop-up startup companies that are coming up with these great little designs for urban and a little bit beyond electrified transportation to get into those more larger mass market areas with some attractively priced battery electric vehicles. Now, I've got a little video on this next segment that I'll, I'll pop up in a sec, and it's just regarding some tips for winter EV driving. Now, as I mentioned in the last couple of shows, I did an audio podcast number six that you can listen to that goes into pretty good depth about winter uh, tips and driving techniques but one of the things I've talked about and I talked to a lot of people about is uh, preconditioning of the car of the battery electric vehicle so what does all that mean so I put together just a quick video I'm gonna throw that up now and explain it what it's all about so one thing I talked about a lot is the use of preconditioning the car now in the winter in the summertime too you can use it for cooling but certainly in these cold temps that we've had here in Toronto area over the last week or so man has the conditioning really come to help well, what do I mean by conditioning? Well, in this case, 
My Nissan LEAF and most battery electric vehicles out there have built-in timers so that you can actually start warming or cooling the car down to a certain temperature at a certain time. In my case, the Nissan LEAF has two timers that are called climate control timers that I can set and uh, which the, uh, what it does is it gives the car the ability to start warming the interior of the car to a certain temperature that I set by a certain time. And it calculates how much time it needs based on you know, what the current temperature is of the car itself, of the, the interior, of the outside environment, and so forth. So as a routine, I have this set for Monday to Friday before I go to work in the morning to heat the car to a certain temperature by a certain time. Well, why that's important, especially in the winter, is for a couple of reasons. And this is good for whether you have your car parked in a garage, it's still cool in here, or outside where it's more, much more exposed to the element. Is that since I'm plugged into the level two charger, as you can see here, my car, the timer has kicked in and it's actually uh, starting to warm up the interior of the car, but it's drawing its power from the level two charger. So it's drawing the power from the home, not from the battery in the car. And you know, if you're familiar with the way heating works, it's kind of like turning on a hair blower or something or a toaster oven or something like that. There's a lot of draw of electricity. It could be anywhere from 1500 to 2500 watts for that initial draw for a certain period of time to warm up those resistive heaters to get that air warm initially when it's really cold. And that's a lot of power that it draws. And why not draw, draw it from your home versus the battery of the car? So what that gives you is you're saving the, the, the power that you have or the, the energy you have in your battery in the car. You're warming up the interior of the car, so whether it's inside, if it's outside, you're melting snow and ice and all that good stuff. You can set your, your heater controls on to where you want it the night before, so it'll come up to the windshield, the, the defrosters, and so forth. In fact, even the Nissan LEAF automatically turns on the steering wheel heater while it's doing this preconditioning or this climate control conditioning. So it uses the heating elements to heat the car heats the interior of the car, but also gets the battery going. And it's kind of like getting up there and going for a jog, get your heart going, get your blood pressure going, get everything pumping. It's the same kind of concept a little bit with electrons, get those things moving, adds a little heat to the battery so that by the time you go out, you're adding a little bit of extension to your driving range because your battery is a little bit warmer and you haven't drawn that energy out of your battery to heat the car initially to get out in, to get going in the morning. So. Uh, the use of climate control timers or preconditioning timers or whatever other manufacturers call it is a great little tip for winter driving for extending the range of your battery, getting your warm nice and cozy before, getting your car nice and warm and cozy before you get into it, and of course getting ready to go in the morning. So it's a nice feature that you should take advantage of. Well, I hope you enjoyed that little video, that it was helpful. And again, if you have any questions, comments, suggestions, things you want me to look into and talk about as well, uh, you know how to reach me because this is the end of the show. So I'll give you my email address. It's evrevolutionshow at gmail.com. Please send me any feedback that you have as well. And I'd love to hear from you through that uh, email. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at evrevshow is my Twitter handle. Um, I always try to post relevant stuff up in Twitter and I love to hear from people as well. It's getting pretty active on Twitter. A lot of stuff going on. So uh, in combination of these shows and the podcasts and Twitter and some of the other social media, it's great to continue getting information out there uh, you're watching this show most likely via YouTube because that's where it, only where it is of course um, so if you are I hope you have subscribed if you have not subscribed then please click that uh, please do if you'd like to and of course you can click the bell and you'll get automatically notified when I put up a new show I mentioned the audio podcast earlier I continue on with those you can find those on uh, through iTunes through your um, favorite podcast app on app on iOS, Android, Google Play uh, apps as well through the Google Play um, music player. And you can also find the podcasts, the audio podcasts on TuneIn Radio, Spotify, and now Stitcher. I just recently was signed up for Stitcher and it's up on there if you can find it. And as always, a big heartfelt thanks to my Patreon supporters for supporting me and my efforts here to put these shows and activities that I'm doing together. You can check out my page at www.patreon.com forward slash EV Revolution Show and look at the details about uh, pledging if you see, think that you'd like to, even a dollar a month. Not a dollar a day, but a dollar a month is that's the minimum uh, could help go a long way to help me continue to do what I do here on these shows and continue to expand and, and evolve and all that good stuff. So until next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. And again, stay safe and we'll see you when we see you later on. Bye bye. Uh -huh.